speaker for today, Maxim. Give him a warm round of applause. All right. Check, check, check. All right. What a nice crowd. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Max. Uh, today I'm going to talk about trends in data. And by, by that, I'm going to speak about the, the meta level of that. So trends uh, in data teams. So common patterns and challenges uh, in modern data teams. Before I get started, I want to just thank uh, the organizers and all the speakers today. Uh, so these things are largely possible because uh, people take the time to organize them. and. Uh, and the speakers are also uh, you know, uh, enablers to make this happen. So round of applause and thank you, uh, <laughs> organizers. <clears throat> so um, I'm a little bit jet lagged, but uh, I feel pretty good now. Uh, I know it's the end of the day too, and it's been a long day, so bear with me. I'm going to try to be uh, entertaining uh, a little bit, or at least like, uh, try to um, keep everyone awake in this uh, last hour or maybe more like 40 minutes. Um, so this might not be like directly a Python talk, but it is a data, like trends and data talk. And I feel like the Python community is really close to uh, data teams. So a lot of Pythonista are either working as part of data teams or close to data teams. Um, and hopefully you find the content uh, relevant here today. Uh, before I get started, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. So my name is Max. I work at a place called Airbnb. So I flew yesterday uh, all the way from uh, San Francisco area uh, to come here. I have good friends that live in Stockholm. So I thought this was a really great opportunity for me uh, to, uh, to travel over here on the company dime. Uh, <laughs> so uh, really stoked to be here and I'm um, looking forward to enjoy the week here. Um, um, uh, if you, some of you in the room here might have heard about Apache Airflow. So that's a project I started uh, about three years ago when I uh, joined uh, Airbnb. And I kind of joined Airbnb on the premise of working uh, on Apache Airflow. And that was my first uh, open source project. More, uh, more recently, uh, I've been working on something called Apache Superset. Uh, now, we're not quite sure about the Apache part of Superset because Superset uses React, and there's been this uh, Apache Software Foundation ruling, so we're caught in the crossfire uh, there a little bit. Uh, but uh, regardless of what's going to happen with that, um, Superset is uh, strong and has a great future ahead of itself. So uh, a little bit more context about uh, what Airflow and Superset uh, are as tools. So Airflow is a platform to programmatically author, schedule, and monitor uh, workflows. And it's often used for data pipelines. So if you have a lot of cron jobs that have intricate sets of dependencies uh, that you need to run and orchestrate every day, um, Airflow can really help uh, your organization organization to schedule um, and to, to keep you sane while you run tens of thousands of batch jobs every day. Um, Superset um, is a, uh, an enterprise-ready business intelligence web, web application. So it's one of the only open source data viz tool out there. Uh, it makes it really easy for people to, um, to basically create data visualization, create dashboards. Uh, it ships with a SQL IDE. So it's really kind of the, a tool set for um, you know, analysts and engineers and you know, pretty much anyone uh, that wants to create you know, charts and reports and dashboard uh, and share them internally. Um, so prior to um, Airbnb, I was at Facebook. Uh, and at Facebook, I was. Uh, working on big data framework to compute engagement and growth related metrics. I've been doing a lot of like big data pipelines there, uh, definitely like a petabyte scale. So um, big, big uh, data pipeline type applications. Uh, before then, I was at a place called Yahoo. Uh, it's kind of fading, but you might have heard of it. Uh, <coughs> so back, uh, back then, it was kind of the birth of Hadoop. Uh, and you know that was kind of interesting to, to watch, and uh, it really looked back then like Hadoop was not going to go anywhere, and it turned out to be this really uh, widely adopted open source piece of software, which is great. And prior to that, I was at a place called Ubisoft, uh, and I was a data warehouse architect. So I've been doing all sorts of data work um, in all sorts of organization over the past, what, 15 to 20 years. Um, 
So, uh, yes, and more recently, uh, I've been um, doing a lot of evangelization of uh, my open source projects at all sorts of companies internally in Silicon Valley. So, uh, so I got to visit all these places and more, um, and I got to kind of uh, um, get this insider view on what's happening within data teams. So I made a lot of contacts at different companies, um, and I feel like I, I got a really good sense for uh, what are some of the challenges that data teams are facing and what are some of the, the solutions that they're putting in place and toy toying with. Um, so yeah, I've got this kind of unique insight, and today's talk is really about uh, looking at those trends uh, that I have observed. And uh, so I've got about a, a, a dozen uh, data tr uh, trends around data, and I'm gonna go through them and try to explain, you know, if they're they a good trend, um, how to kind of get on board with the, this trend and how to uh, kind of embrace it and move forward with it. And if they are uh, kind of bad trends, then I'll, I'll try to explain how to mitigate these trends and how to you know, um, av avoid getting in the, in the pitfalls and problems that might be related to them. Uh, so why a dozen? It's really just a dozen, because this is what I, you know, when I was done preparing this talk, I counted how many, and there was about a dozen, so nothing very logical there. All right, cool. So one of the first trends I want to talk about is this explosion of data. Uh, data is really going mainstream, uh, at least in Silicon Valley, where a lot more people are involved in what I would call the analytics process. So that means uh, from generating data to uh, transforming data to organizing it to anal analyzing it uh, to you know running uh, machine learning type of workload. So. Um, I think it used to be that there was a specialized group of people that, that were working with data, and now um, it's a lot more um, distributed, right? So uh, even like business analysts uh, lear are learning SQL. Uh, everyone in the company has access to um, all sorts of tools uh, from notebooks to uh, business intelligence type tools. And data is really becoming a dimension of every uh, job pretty much. Um, so this is this is a great trend, and I would say like embrace this as much as possible. So giving access to data to people is great, and uh, you know kind of training your company to be more uh, data driven is also a very positive thing. Uh, one one trend that I have observed is that a lot of companies have uh, data training programs. So at Airbnb, we have something called Data University, which is a, an internal program where we try to get. Um, everyone to become uh, better with data. Uh, so that means if you're a business analyst that wants to learn SQL, you can take some classes uh, and become more proficient with SQL. Uh, that means that if you're a data scientist and you want to learn uh, how to use Scikit-Learn, you know you can take a class around that. So we we have this uh, about like a dozen classes that uh, people from all across the company can take uh, to become more uh, proficient with data. Um, we also have like a whole spectrum of tools, right? So people have different skill sets, uh, and we really want to make sure that everyone has the right tool for the job that they want to do, and a, a tool that matches their their skill set. So that means uh, drag it from drag and drop BI to uh, notebooks to uh, you know pipeline authoring tools to all sorts of frameworks. Cool. So next next trend um, is uh, we noticed that uh, the the dashboard seems to have like shorter and shorter life cycle. So as more people get involved with data, um, you know, it used to be historically that there would be a team that would create some company dashboards for the whole company, um, and these dashboards would have you know life cycles that would be counted in months, maybe in years. So you'd have a company dashboard, you'd have a CEO dashboard, you'd have a, perhaps like a finance dashboard, and these would would live for very long. Um, what we're seeing now is that um, since everyone is uh, writing pipelines, creating data structures, um, 
you know, and making dashboards and report, we see that the life cycle of dashboards are, are merely uh, weeks now. So people will take an area, uh, there's some questioning or some, some area of the company that uh, people are really interested in at that point in time. They'll build some dashboard, uh, they'll run some A-B tests, they, they'll make some presentation, they'll make some decision, um, and then, you know, the dashboard that was supporting all that uh, will probably kind of fade very quickly as people move on and go ask a new set of question. So that's something that to me is positive. Uh, that means that the, the analytics process is spinning um, and, and something to embrace uh, to enable this. I think it's good to have really fast-paced tooling. So with Apache Superset and databases like uh, Druid.io, we're able to make it really easy for people to uh, slice and dice data very, very quickly. So that means like, you can go from zero to dashboard in 10 minutes. You know, you can do, uh, while you slice and dice, you're able to do, uh, to look at, say, dozens of cuts of data in, uh, in under a few minutes. So that's really important to have tools and databases that uh, really fuel um, kind of fast analytics. Um, so all of this leads to a phenomenon that's a little bit more scary, uh, which I will call uh, chaos in the data warehouse. So as we invite all sorts of people uh, to, to be part of this analytics process, and as we let, say, at Airbnb, we have like an army of data scientists. There's about, uh, like there's north of a hundred data scientists. There's, uh, you know, hundreds of engineers. There's uh, dozens of data engineer, data infra people, and all these people are writing pipelines and dashboards and creating table, um, and that's, Generally a positive thing, except for the fact that, you know, all these people are not necessarily data warehouse architect, they're not necessarily trained at writing uh, data pipelines. So, uh, so what we, we've observed there is that there's quite a bit of chaos in the data warehouse. So that means our, our airflow pipelines at Airbnb are, you know, we have thousands of them and it's moving very, very quickly. Uh, there's you know, tens of thousands of tables in our Hive Hadoop cluster. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to understand which part of information is reliable versus like what is some information that is uh, fading, right? So someone might have created a pipeline that doesn't run anymore. Uh, you're trying to figure out, you're trying to find some answers and there's a lot of uh, dead ends. So, uh, so that can lead to a messy warehouse, a loss of consistency, and ultimately uh, loss of trust in data. So that means that if you want to take data-informed decision and people don't trust the data, you're kind of, uh, you, you're working against yourself, right? So what would be uh, some solutions uh, around that to mitigate this, this challenge and this issue would be um, to invest in data engineering. So data engineering is, uh, the, you know, it's this um, profession, I guess, that's around uh, the, the idea of like building pipelines, building data, data structures, and uh, doing that in a reliable, trustable way. So investing in data engineering might be part of the solution. Um, there's something that I, I would call trimming your lineage graph. So what is the lineage graph? So if you picture that every data object, like pipelines, tables, uh, reports, dashboard, uh, machine learning type of computation. These things um, have dependencies on each other and together they form a complex uh, graph of dependency. And you know, some of the portions of that graph are becoming kind of stale or you know, if it was a tree, there would be dead branches and dead leaves. So it's important to uh, have some mechanism to go and force people to trim the, de the dead branches and the unhealthy part of this graph. So uh, that can be done by uh, nagging owner, uh, the owners of objects that are not being uh, used very much. So say you can have scripts that will look at what are some tables or some dashboards that are not being used, and then sending email to people saying, no one is using your dashboard, it's not been refreshed in a while, please go and delete your stuff, your stuff that no one uses anymore. Um, another solution in this space is to uh, raise awareness about costs, right? So if each engineer uh, receives a weekly digest of the, the costs in terms of compute and storage that they are using um, in, the, in and around the data warehouse, uh, sometimes just a little bit of awareness might um, kind of uh, enable people to go and trim uh, the stuff that is not necessary, right? You might write a pipeline 
a data pipeline or you might run uh, some forecasting model and you absolutely don't realize that it costs the company $100,000 a month. Uh, but if you receive a digest that tells you uh, just how much you use, then you, you're probably going to go and be like, okay, let's squeeze the value out of this thing and, and, and now shut it down. Uh, so more mature companies are get better at um, kind of dealing with all this chaos into the data warehouse. So all of this brings uh, well, another solution, I guess, around the chaos in the warehouse is the need for a metadata search engine. Uh, so if you do have tens of thousands of tables, tens of thousands of, of, data, of data pipelines and dashboards and reports, how do you make sense out, uh, out of all this data? Uh, so. You know, what would the internet be without a search engine? Uh, let's say you didn't have Google or any search engine, the, the internet would be a lot less useful. So search engines are a very good way to, uh, to kind of, uh, you know, m make it easy for people to find uh, relevant things. So what we did at Airbnb and what we've seen other company or what I've seen other companies do in Silicon Valley is that uh, they, they essentially create a metadata search engine. So that means we build, uh, I can describe the way we do this at Airbnb, but we build a big um, graph that's essentially the lineage graph I was talking about. So we take all of our tables, all the column information, uh, all the usage information, as well as like dashboards, pipelines, logging schemas, um, machine learning models, notebooks, and we put all of that in a Neo4j uh, database, which is just, it's just a database that's specialized in uh, graph operations. Yeah, uh, anyone found Charlie yet? <laughs> or Waldo, sorry, Charlie's the French version, but yeah, if you do find Waldo, scream. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, so, so we put all this data in a Neo4j database. We run PageRank uh, against that database. So PageRank allows us to figure out, like, to score the different data objects and find their relevance. Uh, I kind of forgot to mention that we put usage information, too, in that graph, right? So we, we know which tables are used a lot, which dashboards are used, used a lot, and we, uh, we run PageRank on that kind of ranking um, all the objects, and then we put, uh, we export all this data out of the graph database into Elasticsearch, and we build a nice little web app so you can go and search for things like bookings in China, or you can look for, uh, you know, uh, like user information, and then you'll find uh, relevant, like the most relevant dashboard tables uh, and things like that. I believe we have a blog post on our engineering blog about this. Um, so that's a, that's a pattern that we see uh, emerging uh, at many like data mature companies that they're, they're uh, building you know, tools to help sort out uh, all of their data objects. All right, next trend um, is around open access to internal data. So more and more, uh, we see that people, um, it's easier for people to get access to internal data. So maybe historically, when I was working in data warehousing, maybe 10, uh, 10 years ago, we would think a lot about who should have access to what, right? And we would build very complex security matrix of who should have access, you know, we'd look at the different fact tables, the different subject area in the data warehouse, and the different teams, and try to figure out like who needs access to what, and try to block off people from accessing information they don't need. Um, so, you know, that, that I would assume is to try to uh, kind of mitigate the chances for uh, the risk around leaks and stuff like that. But the trend that we're, we're observing is many of the Silicon Valley companies just like pretty much provide wide access to data to most uh, engineers and employees. Um, of course, there are some risks and there are solutions around mitigating these risks. Um, so what we see in a lot of cases is that people will create an anonymized data warehouse where there's no PII. Since there's so much regulation around uh, personal, personalable, ide identifiable information, right? So everything that's like could lead to identifying a user, we kind of uh, anonymize. And we create this large portion of the warehouse, uh, which has basically uh, anonymized data, and then we give access to everyone. And the goal with that is that, uh, to try to limit the number of missed opportunity, right? So if, you, if you, you, you need some access to information that you don't have, and it's hard to get access to that information, you might miss out on, on making data-informed decisions. Right? And the goal is really to 
empower people and processes with data. So if you don't have access to the data that you need, uh, you, there's probably some missed opportunities there. Um, another thing that we see companies doing around uh, open access is um, auditing, kind of keeping track of what everyone is doing with the internal data and telling their employees, like, you have wide access to data, but we're looking at what you're doing. And if you run a query that you should probably not be running, we might escort you out of the building today, right? And, and companies, uh, comp companies around the valley don't uh, kid around about that. And we have seen people get escorted out of the building. Uh, you know, you can imagine that, say, if an engineer uh, on any platform that has messaging was to um, run a query to go read messages of someone that they know, uh, that would be kind of an instant, uh, you know, get out of here type of situation. Cool. So next trend is uh, notebooks uh, being on the rise. I think the, the Python community is very familiar with notebooks. I think notebooks were, were really uh, popularized, you know, with IPython notebook. I think they, maybe they were inspired from things like RStudio. And uh, I'm not sure about the history of notebooks, but one, one thing is for sure is that uh, they're becoming more mainstream. Uh, so. It used to be that uh, notebooks were a little bit of a problem uh, in a similar way that uh, Microsoft Excel was a problem before, where, uh, say, Microsoft Excel, you, you could have categorized as dark matter of data in the company because they're um, pieces of information, data, and, and computation that live on people's uh, laptop or that are not in source control, that are not in databases. Uh, and originally with, with, um, with notebooks, we had this issue too where there was like all these notebooks that contain like code that uh, there was no way to collaborate or debug or, or to know what was going on. Uh, but now we're seeing the rise of uh, multi-tenant notebooks. So things like Jupyter Hub, Zeppelin, uh, Databricks, Cloudera, Workbench. So there's uh, all sorts of open source and uh, and and vendor tools in this space. Uh, my personal experience, uh, so around notebooks, I installed Jupyter Hub at Airbnb. Uh, that was like probably two years ago, and it got really really popular because uh, people were just fed up to. Um, install their own notebooks on their local laptops and having to create uh, environments. So when, when you do the multi-tenant notebooks, you get a lot of value out of being able to set up environments that are close to production and that can talk to the internal microservices. So uh, I would say embrace notebooks, um, invest in them. You know, if you don't have a multi-tenant notebook in your organization and you have Python enthusiasts, uh, it's, it would be really worth it maybe for a hackathon project or um, you know, to, to go and install something like Jupyter Hub and create a set of virtual environments that are uh, preloaded and prepackaged that people can leverage uh, uh, in a way that they don't have to worry about creating their own virtual environments. Uh, one thing we've seen too, as like uh, notebooks become more legit, uh, notebooks are getting checked in production. Uh, so sometimes, as data pipeline or as like uh, you know some sort of a scheduled job that will pro process some data. Um, so I know at Airbnb and many places you can uh, you can take your your notebook and pro uh, productionize it. And in a similar fashion, I believe Databricks got a. Uh, in their product, you can uh, transform a notebook into a dashboard. So that means that the, the notebook would have inputs and outputs. Uh, and you can kind of transform your notebook into a dashboard and tile the different outputs into a dashboard type layout. So uh, notebooks are going mainstream. We do have an open source project uh, that's called a knowledge repository um, out of Airbnb. And this, this project is about making it easy for people to peer review notebooks and to uh, publish them into this uh, knowledge repository. And from that point on, your notebooks are becoming searchable. Uh, people can tag them and favorite them and comment on them. So you might want to check that out um, as well. Cool. So next uh, trend is that open source is winning and cloud providers and, and different companies are selling it. So this slide here shows like the whole, I think this is called, what's this called? It's called like um, 
this sheet in the background is like the, the data the landscape 2016 or 2017. So every year someone compiles that and shows all of the open source ecosystem and all the vendors tools. Um, and it, there's really a crazy explosion still, right? There's a lot of diversions in the data world where there's like new frameworks, new products, new, new companies uh, shipping new stuff every day. And it's been very dizzying to, um, to work in the data space because there's just so much to know about. Uh, but one thing is for sure is that open source is gain, obtaining all sorts of grounds and then even the vendors are at the top are at the top are really often just like packaging open source and putting a little bit of glue code on top of it and uh, selling that stuff. So nothing very new here, but uh, but it's definitely happening. Um, and you know in. I was talking about divergence. There's been some rare convergence uh, around mostly uh, Kafka and Apache Spark. So, uh, so we know that Apache Spark and, and Kafka are here to stay. So those are really safe bets. Uh, while the rest of you know, the open source tooling is still diverging in the data space, these seem to have like, uh, accumulated kind of uh, a lot of velocity, and they're definitely uh, here to stay. Um, as the maintainer and creator of Airflow, I, I would like to see, uh, to see the same thing. And I, we can see it kind of starting to happen. And um, you know, uh, Kubernetes seems like really promising now. Uh, we've heard that word quite a bit today. Uh, and it seems like you know, this abstraction layer or OS for the, the data center seems like a really popular idea that people uh, will embrace too. Um, so that's definitely something positive, right? Any convergence is good because that means when you go from company to company, you just like, the, the skills that you accumulate as a, as a programmer, knowing these things, you can carry over with you. Uh, next trend is uh, serverless being on the rise. So the same way that we've seen uh, a lot of on-prem application moving to cloud over the past like five, five, ten years, probably more like five years. Now we're seeing a move from from cloud uh, to serverless. So. Uh, so there's more services now that are being offered, like under the AWS uh, cloud and Google is, has a whole set of tools that, uh, that you can use, Databricks. Uh, and I left out uh, Microsoft. Like the, I should have probably put them on the, on the corner there, but they did not make it to my slide this year. Uh, but yeah, so. So this is something to embrace, right? Uh, like going around uh, all these companies, they, they all have a data infrastructure team, and there's a lot of redundancy. So the data infrastructure team at Airbnb does very similar things to all the other data infrastructure teams uh, around the valley and around the world, and that's just like a missed opportunity in terms of uh, you know, economies of scale, right? Do we need to have a, t a team of 12 people to manage Hadoop, Presto, uh, Druid, and all these services, or can we just uh, put a group of people at our cloud provider to manage these things uh, and use them reliably? Um, yeah, so another trend around uh, decoupling uh, Co compute and storage, and that's going a little bit deeper into S3. So we see that a lot of people are moving away from HDFS and onto um, S3. So uh, HDFS is the Hadoop distributed file system. Um, so, so I think a lot of people are moving their storage onto S3 or onto uh, Google Cloud Storage and then building, uh, running their Hadoop cluster on top of that stuff. All right, next trend. So as uh, someone working on Airflow, we noticed that a lot of people have workflow um, workflows that start, you can imagine that the top um, process at the top of this workflow would be spinning off a, uh, a potentially say a Spark cluster, then doing all sorts of things, and at the very end would shut down the, the, the Spark cluster that it spawned for itself. So it's like workflows that spawn the, the resources that they need, and that creates a bunch of uh, elasticity. So that means like you, play, you pay only for what you need. It also means that you know, instead of say, having to manage multi-tenancy inside a large Spark cluster, you can just have a bunch of little Spark clusters that uh, you use on demand, right? So whenever you want to run a certain workflow, you provision it for that workflow, you spawn the, resor the resources you need, you use them, and then you shut it down. Uh, and that seems like a very efficient way of doing things as opposed to 
you know, say having a bigger cluster where you have to think about who's going to run which jobs and, and having like pools of resources and all that, that, that sort of things. All right, so this is a Python slide. So we, it seems like Python is gaining all sorts of grounds over R. Uh, I see a lot of people like from the R community or the people that are, are, are more like R enthusiasts learning uh, more Python, and then, which is not as true you know, on the Python side. So people who learn Python can just you know, uh, do everything that they need in, in, inside Python. And, uh, on the, on the R side, when people want to productionize their, their things, uh, we tend to kind of force them to, uh, to rewrite some of their stuff in, in Python. Like we have found that it's kind of dangerous to productionize R. Uh, we try to force people to do more uh, Java or Python, uh, especially like around statistics and machine learning. Cool. So drifting out of impact. Um, so a lot. It seems like there's this movement where we forget about the low-hanging fruit of just doing like basic analytics, right? So analytics is about counting things um, and and out of and then convincing people with the findings that you make while you do analytics. And uh, it seems like data science and a lot of people are very excited about. Uh, machine learning and doing very complex things using complex algorithm, um, but sometimes we forget that the you know the basics is really to just count things and and, and like move forward. Um, maybe something around that to enable more like basic analytics. Uh, again, it's really good to have fast tooling and fast databases, right? If you're able to ask questions and get answer within a few seconds uh, with something like Druid.io and Superset or with something like uh, Scuba internally at Facebook, which is like a super fast and memory distributed column store. Um, so if you can uh, you know, slice and dice the data and get instant answers, uh, then you'll find that your analysts are very engaged and they're going to find all sorts of uh, goals nuggets inside the, their, um, their data sets. Cool. So that, that was the last uh, trend. So I think I went through about 12 trends in data. And I want to take this tangent. Uh, so since this is a keynote, I want to uh, kind of try to inspire a little bit. I know keynotes are about you know, kind of motivating people. And uh, taking this tangent to, to talk about open source and try to motivate people to get involved or get more involved into open source. So, I'm going to tell my story kind of briefly, like my relationship with open source. So about three years ago, I had never contributed to any open source pro uh, projects out there. I had this bucket list item where I really wanted to get involved in open source. I wanted to you know, someday be able to manage like, a large open source project. And I really felt like an outsider. I was like, I, how do I get involved? Like, can I even start a project? Where would I start? Um, and it just seemed like unattainable. Uh, but in reality, you know, I think it's really easy to get involved in open source. And I would deeply encourage people that are not already involved in open source to get um, to, to get involved. And it's it's easy to do by first, you know, promoting open source internally at your company uh, to join companies that are you know uh, open in nature, and to generally you know try to contribute and get ambitious and maybe eventually when you see an opportunity for something that you wish existed but does not exist, uh, perhaps it's, it's more easy than, than you think to, um, to get you know, granted the right by, uh, by your organization or company to just go and start something new. So I would uh, definitely recommend people to get bullish on open source. Uh, it can be really, really good uh, for your career. Uh, the, anno uh, the annoying counterpart of it is like sometimes you have to go and talk about your, your projects at conferences, but uh, uh, other than that, uh, it's, it's great. Um, so cool. So this is me. Uh, I go by Mr. Crunch on GitHub and uh, Twitter. Uh, those are my two big uh, open source projects. And I will be here for um, happy hour. I hope a lot of the people stick around so we can talk about uh, some of this stuff and other things. So, uh, so thank you, everyone. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Yeah, sure. All right. Let's go. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so I had a question about what sort of trends you see in handling backwards compatibility 
because when we have these data workflows and data storages, you have to handle API changes and schema changes, which can of course be quite hard. Yeah. So, uh, so you're talk talking about like how to how to like do change management and uh, workflows. Uh, so that stuff is definitely super challenging, right? Like like doing the, your uh, your alter tables, add columns, and, and stuff like that can break your pipelines, and the timing of all these things can be pretty hard. Uh, we've seen people use Alembic, which is uh, SQL Al SQL Alchemy's uh, version, like database version control tool um, as part of their um, database migration patterns. Um, like in data engineering, it seems like people are winging it quite a bit. Uh, so that means like sometimes like for in the case of Airflow, people might pause their DAG, um, push a new version, you know, run their database migration and then unpause their DAG. And then you end up in a place where if you're trying to go back to a previous version of the code, it won't work anymore or it may or may not work depending on the, the type of migration that you've made. Uh, so that stuff is, is definitely challenging. Um, it's, it's hard to be a data engineer nowadays. Um, I have posted a recent Medium post on, uh, that was called, uh, the downfall of the data engineer, which was following the rise of the data engineer. So if you're interested, there's, there's, I talk about some of these things and some of these challenges in these uh, blog posts. So check out uh, the rise of the data engineer. And then if you want to go further, you can check, check out the downfall of the data engineer, which is less positive, obviously. Yeah. So what's your experience uh, maintaining projects within Apache? Yeah, so I've, I've got like mixed emotions about Apache, um, but like the positive things is the, the Apache brand is really strong and, and Apache makes us like gives a set of guarantees that a lot of people like and it contributes to uh, people feeling more confident about joining or contributing or using your project. So the Apache brand, I, I believe, is still pretty strong. Um, you know, it, it's based on some really good principles, like f like philosophy philosophical principles like meritocracy, uh, you know, they make sure that you have good release cadence, they make sure you have people from a different set of organization working together on the project, right? So the, the project is not, um, is not dependent on a single organization. Like you know that if one organization stop sponsoring the project, it will be well and alive because uh, Apache makes sure that there's diversity of organization rep representing the project. So that's all really good. Um, Apache uses an old set of tools. So yeah, sometimes you have to deal with SVN, which feels like, you know, you get flashbacks from 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and a lot of the tooling and voting and the release process is really hard and heavy. A lot of it is done through email threads where uh, you know you have to like instantiate votes uh, and stuff like that. So mixed emotion, but overall I believe in software foundations. Um, it's, it's very positive. Another thing that's very positive for developers is that your relationship to the project does not go through your employer. So that means that regardless of your relationship with your employer, you have the same role uh, with the project, which, which is great. Uh, recently, uh, for Superset, we've been kind of caught in the crossfire of, uh, you know, sort of the Facebook uh, patents clause uh, with Apache saying a hard no on, on this. So now we're like trying to figure out what we're going to do. But it, it's a great, like, you know, Apache is, is doing kind of, you, you could argue that it's going, doing kind of the right thing or the wrong thing, but it is like protecting other companies that might want to use this project to say like, hey, careful, there's a, there might be a toxic uh, license in, in here. So some, something to consider and really analyze before uh, you get your projects into Apache or any software foundation. You, you, you give up some of the control to, um, to get more, uh, to perhaps grow the community. Um, I don't know how true it is, but there's been a sort of a perception lately um, that companies who don't necessarily have very big data are still using um, 
trying to use big data approaches. Uh, is that a trend you've been seeing, that, that people are adopting big data techniques where it's not strictly necessary? Uh, yeah, that definitely. So, uh, so a lot of uh, the smaller companies are trying to play with the same tools as the bigger guys where it's not necessarily needed to. I think the, w some of the cool thing with the serverless uh, technologies being more popular is that you could say use Presto, uh, which is like a large scale database just by using um, Amazon Athena, which is their kind of um, offering around Presto, right? So um, for smaller companies, I would say maybe embrace some of the big data stack, but as a, in a serverless fashion, you know, stuff like Redshift or Presto or Spanner on Google Cloud or BigQuery. Uh, the thing that, that is dangerous if you, if you play with toys, and by that I mean like tools that are not ready, like say if you do analytics and MySQL, is that there is, there is a ceiling, and if your company is growing quickly, which you usually, that's what you aspire to, may, maybe that's not what's gonna happen, but there's a danger that one day you hit that ceiling and you're not ready for it. So we've seen companies, uh, so say Uber has hit the ceiling with Vertex, and it, the day that it didn't work anymore at their scale, uh, they were in big trouble and they had to catch up on their Hadoop type stack. Uh, we've seen companies uh, like Lyft kind of flirt a little bit too long with Redshift and hit that ceiling too. And all of a sudden it's like all sorts of assets that you've built um, can't grow further, right? Maybe you, you'll fine tune your Redshift cluster and get, you know, raise the ceiling by a bit, but then you're just like, going a little bit further before you have to do a major shift. So I, I would say, you know, plan ahead, but like you don't have to plan like you're gonna be uh, the next biggest company in the world, but you know, you, you need to think about uh, like having a, the right amount of headroom and looking at your growth rate and what technology stack is, is right for you at that point. So you would uh, you'd say there are still, there are approaches that are, um, scalable and perhaps even built for big data that still won't give you too much overhead at a smaller scale. Right, especially if it's serverless, right? right? Like, so serverless would allow you, so say BigQuery, you'll just pay per use, and if you, if you do go 10x next year, it's still gonna work, and if you go 100x the next year, it will still work. Uh, the situation you don't wanna get into is all of a sudden, you know, you've, re you've reached the ceiling and you need to rebuild everything. Um, so, so some, something to think about. I think that stuff is becoming more accessible to, um, you know, there's more and more kind of recipes to spin off your own little clusters of, of things. Uh, but yeah, don't optimize too early to obviously like work on your product, on the stuff that matters. And, uh, but yeah, keep, keep an eye on like for where the ceiling is and how far you are from it. Thank you. Oh, there we are. So what kind of drinks are going to be offered at happy hour in five or ten minutes? Who knows? Do we have a scoop or a public uh, service announcement? Public, public announcement? Hi. Yeah. So one of the advantages of uh, being able to use these big data technologies is combine almost all of the data in a company and produce some sort of summary of everything. But it seems at the same time when a lot of engineering is trying to move away from monoliths and towards microservices, data is often creating new monoliths. Do you have any yeah, so words of wisdom on how to avoid that or if it's even worth avoiding? Yeah, so, so, the, so the different microservices will all have their own silo of data and that's, that's actually a good thing, right? To have like separation of concerns and to say which service on which aspect of the data. Uh, but then you do need, uh, typically, you know, you'll go with uh, data warehousing technologies to bring all of this data in one place. And for companies, typically that will be Hadoop. Right, uh, so it's okay to have a bunch of microservices that use their own, you know, MySQL, Mongo uh, silos, right? So your microservices will, each service will uh, host and, and own and provide services around a certain aspect of the state and the data of your company. But ultimately, you have to take all of this data and export it into one place uh, where, where you can you know, build all sorts of uh, analytics on top of. 
So there's definitely like data duplication there, but it's, I think it's pretty typical to have like these OLTP database, transactional databases in microservices and services, and then bring all of that together into the, 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 big, the bigger uh, like analytics uh, database or lake. Uh, so you mentioned about the companies being data driven earlier, and I was just wondering, do you have a, your own definition of data driven? Data driven, yeah. I think at Airbnb we like to say data informed. Uh, so because I'm not sure exactly why. I think it's like it's it's important to make data informed decision. Uh, what does data driven means, right? So there, there's a lot of, uh, the dis when you think about decision making inside companies, uh, in a lot of cases it can be just fueled by gut or by you know, people arguing, uh, like I think we should do it that way or the I, I would prefer if the button was uh, you know, blue instead of red. Uh, but ultimately uh, what settles those arguments usually are A-B tests and data. So I think data driven, you know, corresponds very or matches very well with like the A-B testing culture. So if you have a really strong A-B testing kind of culture where every um, <clears throat> every intuition as to how to change the project goes through an A-B test that's really thorough and you can really understand like how much this product change affects the core company metrics. Um, that, that's that's a really positive things f thing, and then data driven is also about like finding opportunities and and forecasting and try to understand where you're going. Um, so yeah, data driven would be you know less gut and less um, kind of just business sense or product sense, or at least like use product sense, translate it into uh, what it really means in terms of, of data lift and how which, which metric does it Im impact positively, negatively, and then make decisions based on that. Any other questions? It's time to go for drinks. Yeah. Uh, no more questions. Thank you.